Hi. Rocky. Hey, Keith. Yeah, how are you doing? Good. Keith. Glad you made it. Pleased to see you again. Yeah, yeah. How, how was the trip? Good, good. Hi. Interesting drive. Very good. We're here. We're here. Very now. nice. Cracking shop. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Looking good. Yeah. Here, let me take you on a little bit of a tour. Of course. Cool. cool. Your store is very impressive as well. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. When we uh, uh, we moved here, we were in a, a small shop in Phoenixville, about 10 minutes down the road. Right. Uh, we were there for a couple years, and eventually we moved here, and uh, it was just the first floor. That was it. And it was an old appliance store. So I think I've seen some pictures. I'm thinking, it's the same building, and then you went upstairs. You yep. Do an extension up. Exactly. But yeah. when it was the old appliance store, it was, it was horrible. It looked horrible. Right. But we bought it in 2016 and did renovations, uh -huh. and then the... The five year to, to eight year plan was to put a second story on. Right. So three years later, we're like, yeah, we gotta put a second story on now. <laughs> so we put that on just for the, we move production upstairs. We have, right. we have our TV studio up there and we just expand the store a little bit. But we like to do our own like different yeah. things. So, you know, basically it's, Come up with our own design, so if mm -hmm. you know you want to get it, yeah, it's exclusive. You have to yeah, come yeah. to us to get it. So we did uh, some Viking stuff. Uh, we tried to improve on some of the Irish stuff. Yeah. Um, some uh, fighting like stags. Stuff. Right. Yeah, yeah. Just things like that. Little things just to keep it mm -hmm. fresh. Keep reinventing. Keep just moving everything forward yeah. and make sure it's not, you know, resting on our laurels. I've noticed a lot of people are looking for like two jackets. Yeah. And so it's, it's one of those things you can either wear the vest or a pair of jeans at a later date. So you're, you're getting more for your money. Right. So I know it's you call it Vest in America now. I've yeah. learned. Let's get Vest, yeah. Yeah. So they do put the, say the Vest, but the jacket's either tailored like a, a blazer jacket. So you, you can use it either or. Right. And a lot of people are liking the tweed side of things as opposed oh, yeah. to like the more traditional. Depending on whereabout in Scotland you go as well, it changes. Right. Aberdeen and North is very traditional still. Edinburgh is very hoity toity. Slightly, you speak posh. Yeah. Uh, Glasgow's totally different. Yeah. They're more quite stylish. They might have track suits. You're gonna partner with Adidas and do yeah, a, 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 bit that, a, 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 a Ned kilt. Something like that. It's mm -hmm. crazy the amount of uh, uh, custom tartans and like just the customizations that people want to do in things mm -hmm. now. Compared, like we've been we've been around since 2003. Right. So even from you know 2003 to now, the amount of customization within it. Mm -hmm. has gone crazy over the last yeah, five or six years, I'd say. I've noticed since we came back since lockdown, the bride, the bride and groom, the groom and best man, they may have bespoke their, their outfit, then the rest of the wedding party will have a higher outfit, so right. they're all the same. So if you look at a wedding party and everybody's hired the same, they might, they'll know who the, bride, the groom is and the best man. Yeah, yeah. If you look at the wedding lineup, it's like, well, we're all in the same kilt. So if they kind of tweak their outfit slightly, you're, yeah. st you're still getting six or seven hires, but then you're maybe getting two bespoke outfits out of that as well, which is good. All of our can I take some? Stuff. Can I take some ties home? <laughs> you may need I'll, some. I'll fill my case. I'll take some home. Right. Yeah. I'm going to phone the factory and find out what we're short of and take back. Um, Tricky. The, uh, and we got, you know, extra jackets, extra shirts, extra whatever the hell else. Right. Um, you know, more neckties, more flashes, just, you know, a ton of excess stock. Lots of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, my theory's always been, if we're going to be an online company, we have to be able to ship out immediately. I don't want somebody saying like, all right, I need, I want, you know, this necktie, Grand Menti oh. modern necktie. And be like, okay, great. It's going to be eight weeks for every single order. We're going to be managing this stuff till the cows come yeah. home. So I'd rather, my accountant thinks I'm nuts with the amount of inventory that we hold. Mm -hmm. He's just like, no, 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 you need to cut this nap. I'm like, nah. You can't, you can't. It's the service That's is worth the money. That's what we struggle If we try and have like all this, we've got racks that hold, I think it's 36 ties at a time. Right. So we try and have all this, but if something comes along, so we're picking, 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 something comes along, we've got a reorder level, but then if somebody comes along and orders 24 ties. Yep, next goes one, right through it. It's gone, it's like Cornish National. All these ties came in, they went out the door. But then yep. when you look historically what people order, 
they don't do that many, but then somebody's come in and wiped us out. So they reorder level hunt kicked in straight away, and that's why we fall down. You have no idea how complex designing a kilt hanger can be. There's, there's you more. Them, like, three or something like that. No, 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 no. We go to the manufacturer. All right. The uh, uh, we did this, you know, similar type of thing. Yeah. The uh, so we just have our four, hot, uh, four yep. clips will make a difference because you get that the soggy bit. Yeah. Yep. But it's talking about the like the gumminess of the clip, the All tensile right. strength of the grip, the black. You know, you have to have these little things so that it doesn't scratch on the thing and move them back and forth. It has stained a particular wood. It's Yep. Uh, what you know, style of neck do you want? It's oh, it's crazy. This is our Ooh, production like, facility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's quite impressive. Coming in as well. The uh, take you a little little tour over here. We got, um, I guess, about ten uh, kilt makers now. Each one gets a single needle straight stitch. A uh, couple, right. couple parts machines. Oh yeah. All right. Everybody, this is Keith from Lock Herring. Keith, this oh, is yeah, everybody. All right. Yeah. The uh, we got uh, overlock machines. We yep. have you know, buttonhole. We have uh, belt loopers and stuff like that in the center. Yeah. Um, just try to keep it reasonably spread out. We had a, a crazy amount of reinforcement in the floor. Each oh. each uh, you know truss or you know thing is like 12 inches on center. The yeah, yeah. Are 24. So you can park cars up here. It would be never fine. move. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. a good size cutting table. Like, uh, yeah. This yeah. is the small one. Those are the bigger ones. Bigger ones. Yeah. This is our marketing department. I oh, yeah. use some. Uh, and I, marketing Ooh. and IT, excuse me, guys. This is our studio. Watch all the wires. But uh, cool. Yeah. So we did. It this. just looks like some of these at your, your back room. Exactly. Hi. So we did this when we did the. Uh, uh, we put it on the second story. We wanted to have a a proper sound studio to be yeah. able to you know record stuff. On this episode of Tartan Talk with USA Kilts. We sit down with our friend Keith Russell from Loch Carron of Scotland. All right, Keith. So tell us a bit about Loch Carron. What do you guys do? Uh, we do everything in Highland, Highland industry. We provide woven fabric, woven accessories, tailored goods, through to fashion cloth for the top industries, the top companies in the industry there as well. Um, we do everybody from. You see your top 10 fashion houses to your granny that makes a kilt every year as a one-off. Everybody gets treated the same. I always through the same process. Nice. In our factory in Selkirk. Nice. And how long have you been with Lock Heron and what do you tell us a bit about what you actually do there? I started in January 99 in the cloth warehouse as a cutter. Um, we're a team of like four people. And so we all got on fine working together. So we were like cutting ties out, cutting cloth prepping the cloth for to make it accessories or getting it cut into kilt lens to get shipped out to the customers as well. Right. And over the years it's progressed. Uh, I've done various jobs, other jobs helping out. Then four years ago I asked for what to help out in sales and maternity leave. And I've been there ever since. <laughs> so I think it's, just, it's a good way to see Scotland as well and states yeah. and hopefully further afield in time. And just generally meeting the customers which I probably cut their cloth for all these years. I'm not finally getting to see them now in person. I get some surprises. <laughs> so we'll coming on a YouTube th show, yay! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But it's been really good. Uh, I really enjoyed doing it as well. Like, nice. Uh, so. The did you ever see yourself going this direction or staying with the same company for this amount of time? I mean, like twenty was it twenty three, twenty four years? Yeah. It's quite a while. It's quite a while. Well, when I left school at sixteen, I went into textiles, just working in the factory, just in the shop floor again. And it's just, that's what we did in, when you left school, you either went to college if you were clever <laughs> or you went into Texas because you could start, on a, leave school on a Friday, start a job on a Monday. And I just wanted to have money to drink beer and play rugby on a Saturday. So that's what we did. In, in fairness, that's kind of why I started the company too. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. so you're in a unique position in the fact that you work for a mill as well as you're Scottish and you've mm -hmm. you know, grown up there 100% of your life. So the questions I'm about to ask you and the things I want to touch on, I'm not necessarily trying to have you, you know, speak for all Scots, yeah. so to speak, um, but you have inside information or, or a different angle on things that, you know, not everyone necessarily has. 
So I'll ask this. What do you think is the, the main driving factor, the motivation for Scots to get a kilt today? Well, pride. You're, you're showing your identity as well, and you're, you're advertising that you are Scottish instead of having a big flag in your back saying, look, look at me. You wear your kilt, people know who you are, and you know where you're <coughs> from or your, where your family are from as well. It could be anywhere from the North Pole to the South Pole, wear a kilt, you know you're Scottish. Right. And instead of you saying, where are you from? <clears throat> kind of redundant, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's self-explanatory. Like, but I think a lot of people wear it, just it makes them feel good as well. Um, now, do you think most Scots nowadays, or what do you think the, the mixture is, so to speak, um, of are they wearing it for a sense of national identity? Are they wearing it for a sense of their family heritage? A mixture of both, just a universal, just, hey, having fun with it. Why? Like, get into the, the <clears throat> guts of it. What do you think the mixture reason of is? Mixture of both. Okay. And you can wear it for a football match, and you may hate or an, an international football match. You may be standing in somebody who's the opposite team from you if you don't support each other. It's, it's different football teams. Yeah. You wear your kilt at a football match, you're all supporting the same person. You're, and that's you. You're supporting your team, the Scottish team. Either it's even like football, rugby, cricket, anything like that, you know where you're about. And yeah. um, recently it was the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham. The Scotland team wore a kilt, which was designed by Siobhan McKenzie up in the Highlands. We wove it in Selkirk. So, and one of the team members for the ladies hockey was from Selkirk. So it was great having somebody on that stage wearing our kilt at a big event like that. So it's yeah. a bit of pride as well, a bit like local pride, national pride, and it gets beamed all over the, the Commonwealth as well. Yeah. Now, what do you think the, uh, I'm 21 years old. Right. I'm Scottish. I'm not actually Scottish, but I'm 21 years old. I'm in Scotland. I'm Scottish. I'm going in to get my first kilt. What do you think my thought process is for choosing a tartan? Who's paying for it? <laughs> it's a very good right. question. Because if it's something, if it's like, say it's your granny, or if, like, when your parents are paying for it, they might want you to go, to go down the family name. Right. Or if it's a family tartan, you've had this, your grand, grandparents all the way down the line, they wore that kilt. Yeah, go for that. But you might think in years to come, you think, it's not the nicest tartan. But if you're coming into stuff the street, buying it blind, you wear what you feel, what you like and the colours what you like. If it's something, like I'm a, I'm a Russell, so I wear the Galbraith tartan. I've got that, but I've also got, my wife's a Fraser, so I wear Hunt and Fraser shoes. So I've got a mixture of both and whatever I feel like wearing, I'll wear. If it's a family event on her side, I'll wear the Fraser clan. Or if I'm going to like a rugby match, I'll just wear my kilt for that. And it just gives you that identity, being part of that Scottish team. Yeah, uh, that's a very interesting point, is that, you know, you would wear her tartan just because you're married and, uh -huh. you know, you want to support her and you're going to her family events, so you'd wear their tartan um, in your trues versus your own. So you don't see a, you only wear your own tartan, period, that's it, that's the only one I will wear. It's, you, you'll go back and forth. Yep, and also being working with Lacan, I get a, I've got a few kilts hanging in the wardrobe, so. Yeah. I could have, better like yourself, could wear a different kilt every day, but... <coughs> for a kilt. <coughs> for a kilt, you <laughs> um, But a, you wear a kilt, it's like, it's a good advert, it's an advert for the company as well, wearing one of the new products as well, so you'll wear that. People, what's that kilt? Oh, it's a Buchanan blue. I like that. Then you tell the story where it's come from. Right on. Uh, nice. Now, you said you wove, that Lacaron wove the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the latest Commonwealth Tartans. Yeah. Um, a, what was it like? How did they approach you? Um, was there a sense of pride in it? And your opinion, honest opinion, right? Do you like it? Because there's been there's been some doozies in the past <laughs> with some of the Commonwealth Game yeah. Tartans. So when I first met Siobhan up in the Highlands, we went to her hometown in Rosemarkey, met for a coffee. She showed me her like her designs on a bit of paper. Right. Two weeks later, she was down in the factory. Alice, one of the design team, put it in the card work, put it up on the big screen, printed it off. And it was like, it wasn't more, it was more a contemporary tartan. Then there's a lot more like your tartan checks were all at one side and there's a lot of blue. Then seeing it in the final product, which was made in Glen Isla, they made it into that. And it was like, wow. And when it came onto the, when they walked around the athletics track when it got launched, it was the commentators, here's a Scotland, uh, Scotland team coming on. And it's like, that's good. Yeah. There has been, I think it's trying to change, keep it 
fresh all the time instead of wearing your tracksuit or coming like that we try and be a bit different yeah. and I came on the stage then obviously wearing some people from a local town was in the Commonwealth team as well um, it made a big difference as well so you know where it came from and we got a lot of publicity from the Commonwealth baton came to the factory because we were a supplier so they had we had our, our baton carriers walked around every department which was involved in the making of that tartan starting with Phallus she handed it on to one of the dyers, handed it on to one of the warpers, handed it on to one of the weavers, then to the darner, warehouse, then back to Alice, then handed it back to the Commonwealth team to take it on the next post. So you guys did your own lap, we own lap. around the yeah. around the company before you ended yeah, it Yeah, we handed it back. Like, so I had a little shot of the bat and like, I thought, right, it's, it's pretty cool. Just to be involved with that as well, like, so it made a little bit of difference. Yeah. yeah. Now, what, do you know why they made it, um, it wasn't asymmetrical, but why they didn't, Put a, a a pivot point dead center on the tartan because I remember it was it was off it was off the side. I think yeah, Siobhan yeah. wanted to do it, and I think the waistcoats were cutting the bias as well. So it just made it slightly different from your your box standard kilt outfit, and it did right. stand out. And the colours when the lights came on on the arena, the colours it just went. It was very bright and it worked. Yeah, uh, it's like uh, Anderson, a big set of Anderson almost walking in there. Yeah, nice big colours. Obviously, the Birmingham had their own logo colour, so we some of the colours were incorporated in that as well. And the blue, you can almost say the saltire flag was taken on there as well. Yeah. So you mentioned that some trends in Highland wear in Scotland mm -hmm. are sort of regional versus national. And I think Americans, outside of Highlands, Lowlands, Americans tend to think of Scotland kind of as this amorphous blob of it's Scottish. Right. But it's not, you know, mm -hmm. Aberdeen versus Glasgow versus Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the things that you see as far as trends in that are regional? Edinburgh's very... Quite... I, I like the style in Edinburgh. It's more like your your traditional kilts with a tweed jacket. If you went maybe into like Aberdeenshire, it's more traditional with your black Argyles, Prince Charlies. But it just it varies. But then West Coast, it changes as well. So each area does change a little bit. But eventually, it all comes to if people want to change their hire ranges around. A lot of kilt shops I deal with have got their own hires. And if they keep their existing hires, they just move them about then it's a big step for them to put in like a tweed jacket and it's like, whoa. It's a big expense. It's a big expense. Yeah, yeah. So if they, they, know what they're, they know the market. Um, but certain times, it, what I would look at if you were doing, a, if I was going to like a black tie dinner, I'd put like a, a Prince Charlie jacket on. I wouldn't wear a tweed jacket. Right. For a wedding idea, if you wear like a tweed jacket, it's fine. Then you could wear your tweed jacket in another event later on. You know, it's yours. And you don't feel as like trussed up. So... Penguin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, get the yeah. penguin suit on. But it's like, you feel more comfortable. Um, and also, look, we're finding more trues are getting made as well now. Um, it's quite forgiving sometimes if you wear a pair of trousers instead of a kilt, depending on what shape you are. Yeah, yeah, depending yeah. on the shape. The shape. Um, but we do a lot, a lot of trues, and a lot more higher companies are putting like a selection of trues in as well. Hmm. Just if you get, depending on the family members, if they want to wait for a wedding party, some people don't want to wear a kilt. They've yeah. never worn a kilt, they'll think, oh, it's not for me. The way to put a tartan trousers instead. Hmm. So it's interesting. The um, we've done trues in the past. We actually stopped doing them hmm. because it's what I found was a lot of a lot of bigger guys like wearing trues, and they're not quite as flattering. Yeah. All the bigger guys are definitely a smaller guy type thing. Mm -hmm. So the uh, it's it's very interesting. But I do get the fact that you know if you're if you're looking to hire an outfit and you're just kind of like yeah I'm not sure I don't know mm -hmm. if I want to wear the kilt you know. Now, do you think it's more Americans that are, or or others who are going to Scotland to hire to hire an outfit, but then they want to like they're meh, maybe put off by the kilt a little bit and want to do trues, or is it younger people versus older people, or, or just something different? To just do, period. when you walk in the shop, you'll see a pair of trousers on, like on one of the the, the, the mannequin. Splint, mannequin. I was yeah, going to yeah. say dummy, but God. one of the dummies, <laughs> uh, one of the mannequins, or you see the kilt and think, I like that outfit. You just walk in. It's like walking to a car garage, you'll think, you'll see like a nice BMW, you'll see a Mercedes, I'll think. Right, I'll have that, yeah. I'll have that. That's yeah, what I'll I like. take two. I'll take two, please. Yeah. In red. Different colours, yeah, sure. Yeah. So do for that. <laughs> That's so what you do. The idea is if you walk into a store, it's got a choice of two, you can have that or that, and they're roughly the same price. People go, it's what their choice is, right. or what they're being told to wear. Now, is it trues, as in true high-waisted with the fishtail back, or is it like trousers? I would say trousers just for on the higher side of things. If it is me, like a made to measure, if you're going like doing something bespoke yourself, yeah, you might do a high waist or the fishtail. But most 
I'd say the higher company do like a, like a stand like a trouser. Right. That makes People sense. know how to wear it then. Exactly yep. what I was going to say. Yeah. Now, now trousers mm-hmm. are fine, but when you try yeah. to get up and especially if you have a belly and go up around the belly or the yeah. bottom half of the egg, so to speak, uh, it, they don't tend to stay up as well. No, it's uh, to buy you right in there, <clears throat> wear shape. If you wear like if you if you got a big belly, you're getting something made. Get fish tails and it kind of it hides it. So now we know that Lock Aaron ships all over the world, and they obviously mm-hmm. have a lot of people who buy stuff yep. in Scotland. What do you think? And I'm not holding you to exact statistics, but Roughly speaking, how much of your cloth do you think is exported versus, you know, you know lo- not local, but, you know, in country of Scotland? Right. It's a good question. It's a difficult one because a lot of our companies, what we deal with, export as well. So we might ship to them, then they'll export it to their market. Right. So 70 30. 70 30. 70. In, sc- in, sold Scotland, in Scotland, and then break down 30, that thirty. That thirty could be straight export, straight to, export. to me or yeah. a company in Canada or uh, something like that. Yeah. Okay. They might, that com- that person <clears throat> in, in the states might have dealt with a kilt shop in Scotland all the time. He might only buy his kilts from them, so they'll buy from us, sent to the kilt shop in Scotland. Then they'll get it made, then ship it to the states or wherever. So right. we, we don't know the end product. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So we'd have to ask the individual shops. Yeah. Like how much goes out of there versus uh-huh. stays local. But I, I, I know what we send out, like UPS daily, it is quite a lot. And we have like shipment days, like for yourselves, so we send them out on a Tuesday. Tuesday, I was Tuesday say we should get it on Thursday. Right, yeah. ideally. So we, we've got certain days, so we, we know we've got, it's like a, a Wednesday, Thursday is the busiest day for shipments because a lot of our UK customers get them on a Wednesday or a Thursday. We do a lot of shipping, and some of the states go on a Thursday as well. So ideally, they get all weekend and get delivered on a Monday. All right. being well with customs. <laughs> oh, don't get me started on customs. Yep. Uh, the uh, yeah, they they they've been holding up a lot of things mm-hmm. from UPS for zero reason at all. So yeah, love U.S. customs. Yeah. Thank you, customs. <laughs> all right, now you've been with Lock Aaron since 1999, so you've oh. been there for quite yep. a while. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the the evolution of the industry as a whole and different trends within the last 20 or so years. I mean, we've been in business since 2003, so we've seen Mm -hmm. a similar amount of change over time. Um, Let's start older. How do you think the internet itself changed the industry? How much did you know about it before, you know, before internet, so to speak? But 99 was still beginning of internet times. It was there. Um, I, th- I can't remember exactly when we launched our own website, but it was it was a big learning curve, um, <laughs> and we've got like a team of like five runs our web, and the algorithms and things like that. I just kind of no idea, but you, what we have found people because it's advertising the internet, they're wanting it next day. Mm-hmm. I called it the Amazon effect because of the lockdown, people are shop- shopping on Amazon, get it next day or get it for ten o'clock next day in the morning. People are buying stuff. If it's not in stock, we have to make it, and it doesn't. It doesn't happen overnight, and we always try and run a stock in the factory. But we're we're supplying shops, retail as well as well, retail, wholesale, and web. So we're kind of juggling all three. So we're trying to get an even balance all the way through and try to keep everybody happy. Some products, if you want a kilt, you're not going to get it next day again day yeah. delivery. Some people realise that, which is great. Uh, but there's always a factory you have to kind of factor in just in case something further down the line, throws a spanner in the works, it runs slightly late. And we always try and keep the customer up to date. It's like keeping everybody up to date. And it's like full time, like, this is what's happening. You almost like every process, this is where we're about, this is where we're about, once it's left. But once they get the product, they're happy. Yeah. yeah. Now that's one of the things that, uh, when when we started early on, the uh, there's, there's the old the old saying that, you know, people in the UK think that 200 miles is a long way, and people mm-hmm. in the US think that 200 years is a long time. The uh, the one thing that I thought right from the jump was, look, America is way too big. If I'm going to give a go at having my own, you know, kilt company in the U.S., we have to have an online store and mm-hmm. it has to be good because yeah. there's no way that anyone's going to travel here just for yeah. us. Um, you know, back in 2003 when we had a 500 square foot cottage. Um, so it's always been very, very uh, uh, seminal core to what we do is trying to service people mm-hmm. online and trying to give a similar in-store experience 
through the website, yeah. through customer service, through email, as we do here in the store, as I'm sure you guys do, as companies in Scotland do. The uh, but it's you're, you're right with the internet and with people wanting stuff, you know, next day kind of thing. Mm-hmm. The amount of inventory you saw you saw yeah. it downstairs. The amount of inventory you have to carry mm-hmm. in order to ship things out yeah. the next day, so you're not disappointing people and or be very very upfront with like, okay, you're you're ordering a kilt. It's gonna be eight weeks. It's gonna be ten weeks. Mm-hmm. It's gonna take this long because there's all these different things that have to go through the process. It's a lot more convoluted. Than, than most people understand and that I I thought of or I, I would even think about, you know, from, from way back then. It's just, yeah, the learning curve, as you said, is mm-hmm. is very steep on stuff like yes. that. So with, um, let's go this direction, uh, industry trends. So the what I've, what I've termed the Braveheart effect mm-hmm. or Outlander or uh, uh, Period, period dramas like yeah. uh, Downton Abbey or Peaky Blinders and stuff mm-hmm. like that. How have those affected? And has any one affected? Now, uh, Braveheart's a little before your time. Yeah. Um, but what do you think those have done for the industry? Mm-hmm. Good, bad, indifferent? Is it watering down the heritage um, and just kind of playing with it? Or is it a boon for the industry in general? I think, well, I think it's a boon for the industry in general. But then people kind of look into their more, the history more. That it, it shows Scotland in a great light, what we all do. Then there's so many different aspects of that outland of what you can do. You can, you know, my wife's a Fraser, Jamie Fraser. I would never wear, so I'll wear the family side Fraser. It's fine. But it's like, I would kind of, it's good for the industry. And you know, we've done stuff for like Shrek in the past. We've made a Shrek tartan for mm-hmm. the launch. Mike Myers for the launch of yep. Shrek. Yep. Braveheart. Uh, one of her kilt makers made Mel Gibson's kilt for the, the world premiere, and she still got a picture of her up on the wall of Mel Gibson wearing her kilt, and it's like, and so it's still there and it still lingers on. Even going further back, you went back to Rob Roy, Rob and, Roy, yep, um, the one with Sean Connery, um, Clan McLeod, yep, yep, Highlander, yep. Highlander, yep, 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 yep. you know that like, um, <clears throat> it just shows it in a good light, and obviously like Elon Doncaster on the west coast of Scotland, it's used in so many films as well. You thinking. You go in there, they've, they've got, you see tartan there as well, like, and it's no, it's it's relevant to that area. Uh, it's good. I think yeah. it may, every bit, every little lad there helps the whole textile industry, but then it helps the whole country in general. Yeah. People come and visit. <coughs> North Coast 500, it's a great ad for Scotland. Um, I'd love to have like a, a sports car and drive it, but it's not the road for a sports car. I, I it, would it, die. It, 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 it's. Um, <laughs> It's interesting, but it's cracking scenery. So the amount of people, if you could have a clicker, every time you know somebody's going to do it, you'd be a rich man every, if you got a dollar for every time somebody was doing it. Yeah. Um, no, it's, I've I've said uh, on the show before, um, tartan is Scotland's gift to the world. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's amazing to me how small the industry actually is. Mm-hmm. And the fact that pretty much everybody knows each other. They pretty much yeah. get on for the most part. Um, and it's, it's not that big of an industry it's like there's you know what several you know a few larger mills yeah and then a bunch of or a few smaller mills mm-hmm. and it's very much a cottage industry still but it's it's propped up through you know through through the world's love mm-hmm. of scotland and yeah. the world's love of tartan and through the you know the 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 heritage and the pride and everything that comes with it mm-hmm. um so i like the fact you know if if you're if you're concerned, not you, but you know, in general, if people are concerned that you know movies water it down, mm-hmm. or you know, it's they're they're playing with it, or it's not they're not serious enough, or Braveheart was just yeah. a, a fantasy thing and it's all lies and it's not true at all. Um, yes, but also, it's good for the industry, mm-hmm. and without stuff like that being good for the industry, the industry would crumble, and then without the industry, the tradition, the heritage, yeah. all of it would kind of go away. So it's. Either either you see it as good or you see it as a necessary evil, but one way or the other, I think it's it has to kind of be done, and it's a, it's a good just as you said, an mm-hmm. advert for Scotland in general. Just uh, and you know, like people depends what mills you touch and what mills you use. People know the mills and they know that the, what they do, and it's like each mill has the same tartan, but it's slightly different take color wise. You like the mm-hmm. color for that mill, you go to that mill. You like this mill, you go to that mill. It's that's what yeah. people do. Like and it's like. We all do the same, and it's just it is promoting Scotland as well. 
Yeah, and I I also love the fact that uh, like uh, now not as much now because you've expanded your range, has done House of Edgar and you know mm-hmm. a bunch of different mills. But like when you went back, you know, twenty five years ago, it was you know Lock Heron didn't really do many thirteen ounce, and no. House of Edgar really didn't do many sixteen ounce. It was kind of a handshake yeah. agreement, gentleman's agreement. Yes. Of, okay, we'll stay a little bit out of your pond, you stay a little bit out of ours. Mm-hmm. You know, same thing with Strathmore, and you know they're just kind of a smaller fish in a, in the pond, but there's still there's still a mutual respect yeah. that your mill has for you know different competitors, and mm-hmm. it's 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 rare that it's you get an industry like this where it's not just cutthroat where i uh, want them out of business i'm going to do everything they do i'm going to take them down yeah. it's there's a respect there for you know the the common love of scotland mm-hmm. and the common good yeah because even i know like we all speak to each other and if it's like if something you have such like thing can you do this we'll help each other out like we'll not as you say we'll not go that no, we're all in the same boat we're all looking to help each other yeah i think that's part of being one big family yeah <laughs> it's it, I, was, I remember hearing a story about how uh, 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 Andrew Elliott or you know Robin Elliott from yeah. Andrew Elliott would like swap uh, yarns back and forth with dog leash because they're right yeah. near each other. Hey, I'm, I'm out of muted green threads. Can you give me some of those? And you know, they kind of trade yeah. back and forth. So it's neat to see it's not just straight cutthroat. And that's that's across you know this. It's I would also say it's across you know kind of expanding it out into a little bit more of the 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 pond that I swim in, like the Irish shops in America and, you know, in NACTA and North American Celtic Trade Association, there's a lot of mutual respect or like, hey, I'm out of this sweater and this yeah. size. Does anyone have one? Mm-hmm. They can have like, you know, boom. And you just either pass it on to the shop, they pay yeah. wholesale and done, or they send their customer to you. Yeah. And it's not like a, oh, I would never send my customer to that guy. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's a neat industry with a lot of mutual respect. Yeah. So even in like, say like the, the higher industry in Edinburgh, like uh, if the can't, one shop can't help that person, if you try up the road, he'll help you out, give him a phone call, you'll, somebody's coming up to see you, perfect, and vice versa, that happens. So even the higher shops look after each other as well. So although being the, the weaving side of things, we all look after each other, the higher side looks after each other as well. Like uh, So everybody's looking for the same thing to make everybody happy. Nice. I wish yeah. more industries were like that. That's yeah. pretty awesome. Now, in your opinion, what do you think the biggest threat to the industry is no sheep no sheep <laughs> a world shortage of sheep would yeah. be very difficult no seriously i think it would be that's what we need we need sheep to make the yeah. way at end store but i think to realize and have support for the farmers as well to make sure everything's done right and you know where it's coming from a lot of people are looking for traceability now so we know we're like we've got we're using british owners with 16 ounce fabric Hopefully in time we'll be able to find out more about where you can almost identify the farm, where it comes from. And it's like the the sorting office for all the wool from south of Scotland north and Northumberland in England. It's got to be based in Selkirk. I think it's as of from next year. So all the wool's got to come into, into, into Selkirk itself, then get shipped to like Spinners in Yorkshire, back up the road so people will know where it's coming from. One of the farms, what we... If you look in our video, you can see that one of the farms that we use is, is th- it's three miles from the factory. So if it's three miles from the factory, it's the sorting office is like 100 yards along the road. It's 200 miles to get it spun, 200 miles back. It's back in the factory. It's not travelled that far in the bigger yeah. scheme of things. And we know we're supporting like a, another local industry as well. Um, so we, we use um, Cheviot sheep and a Romley Marsh mixture to make our 16-ounce strom. It feels slightly different, but if you get, to, you don't want to go and fill in everybody's kilts, but you know that there's a difference. Like I think. Yeah. The uh, no, I agree. The um, uh, the house of or Jimmy, the uh, La Caron Strom cloth, uh-huh. it definitely has a a slightly different feel to it. Even in the brie rake and, uh-huh. and the uh, uh, the reaver quality, it's definitely got a, a slightly softer you know, uh-huh. feel to the cloth. You know, I we joke that, you know, you can just wave an iron at it and it just drops dead. It's yeah. just like, oh, that's it. Done. <laughs> permanent crease, done. Uh-huh. Um, versus some of the other mills, you really got to put some pressure behind it to actually get mm-hmm. it to, to sit nice and yeah. flat. The, um, the one thing that's kind of been highlighted to me um, through an American weaver, um, as well as, uh, not Tartan, but an American weaver in general, and it's been kind of uh, highlighted during the pandemic, is the supply chain mm-hmm. and how... 
like crazy fragile it actually is. Yeah. That's the thing that kind of scares me as an outsider, not knowing every mm -hmm. single facet of the business, is the supply chain mm -hmm. of the of the sheep. Or if there's yeah. something were to happen to the sheep, some kind of disease or something, right. or the or the the dyer houses mm -hmm. or the finishers, um, and how fragile that would be. I think it's like the whole. <clears throat> the last two or three years have shown how fragile that, that everything has been. The good thing is we've got good supply chains now, and it's like we get a role for other places as well. And um, we're finishing the company what we use is six miles down the road, and it's been there since the year Dot and Gala Shields, and it's like it's company owned now. It's like it's been a management buyout. They run it, and it's you know you, you can take stuff there. As you walk in, you walk through the uh, Schofields, and you walk through. You can see fabric for about every weaver in the country sitting there, <laughs> so you know it's going there. They're getting smaller and smaller, but people still use them, one, because they're good at what they're doing. And you know, we've got soft water where we live, that makes a difference. All these little things makes a difference, so you put it there. Yeah. And if they go away, it's not coming back. <gasps> That's the that's, or, a that's, that's, a panic. that's any of it. Yeah, exactly. It's good if you go next. <clears throat> yeah, it's mm -hmm. that's why you had to go to you know. Uh, there's some uh, is it a town or two in the Highlands that have a couple different you know mm -hmm. actual looms and that kind of thing. Yeah. From an aspect of you have to support it because if John is the guy who you know yeah. knows how to warp everything up and John either retires and doesn't pass mm -hmm. it on or if John gets laid off mm -hmm. and goes and gets a job you know painting. Yeah. Um, then that knowledge just goes away. And then over time, it kind of hollows out yeah. the ability of the industry to function. I think a few years ago at Locarno, we went through about a year. I think we had 12 people retire in one year. <sighs> and it was like, oh. where, where did you get that? If you added up their years of knowledge, yeah, it was like, holy. So once we've came back after lockdown, we've we've employed a lot more like apprentices. So we've turned about maybe eight apprentices. So they're all youngsters. They're all in the early 20s. So it's coming through. So we're all just member of staff. It's like, in their 60s, their youngest person is like maybe 21. Right. So we've got the young people are coming through. Historically, they wouldn't do that because they could, they could do other jobs. Didn't really think working in textiles was like for me. But we only work a production work a four day week. So you've got a, Must three, be nice. a, a three day weekend. So it, it works for a lot of people. And we have found people that's come from hospitality have come into the industry because they don't want to work in hospitality. Yeah, with, they realize how fragile their jobs are. Yeah, so yeah. work there, you know, it's a steady job. Go for it there, like, huh? so. Right on. So, looking forward, uh, five years, ten years, where do you think La Caron is going to be, is is going, mm -hmm. I should say, and where do you think the industry is going to be? What are the next things that you think are going to pop off in the same way that Weathered popped off and then Tweeds popped yeah. off in the last ten years or so? I think it comes around, it comes around in cycles, so you might think, oh, come around again, you go back to your Argyles, Prince Charlie's, or come around, in my opinion, but... <clears throat> Something they'll always have one hanging up in their wardrobe. One, they might not get in it, so they'll have to go and get another one, which is good. Yep. Um, everything, fashion changes as well, so a lot of people will be looking for the sustainability side of things, and you kind of get more sustainable than what we do there now. It's no fast fashion. Yeah. It's it's there. None of uh, this is fast fashion. No. It's, it's <clears throat> that's the beauty of Highland Wear, mm -hmm. is that, you know, from the 1920s through yeah. now, not a whole lot has no, changed as far changed. as no. on the formal end. No. So you'll have little, you know, offshoots mm -hmm. and things like that, yeah. but it's still, you could look, you know, take somebody from the 30s or the 40s and put them at a, at a you know, a black tie affair now, mm -hmm. and they'd still look pretty still, damn good. Yep. Yeah, and we sometimes get like family, like family kilt coming in, and it's like their great grandfather's. And it's what you wear it like, and you look at it, and it's like you open it up, it's got a little car and label, and you're thinking, oh, what's this? <laughs> and, but it is right. And obviously, investing in machinery as well, you have to, you kind of rely. Mm. It'd be great to have the old Dob Cross limbs run forever. But there comes a point, you can't kind of make put the yardage what we do on that. Yeah. So we have to keep investing in new limbs. Um, we've got like new Dornier looms and 2019, 2018, we've got Carl Meyer warp mill. So we, we invest in new stuff, but then it's crazy. The next warp mill next to the Carl Meyer is something from the 1950s. And it's it works. Yeah. Our dye house, some of the pots are probably older than you and me put together. <laughs> and you're thinking to invest in that side of things is it's an awful lot. So we're trying <clears throat> in the machinery side, they're no broken, you can you can still fix. When you look at some of the 
the looms that we have, the computer chips might be, the circuit boards might be done, and try to get spares for them. The older stuff you can make, yep. you can't really do the computer side of some of the the, the, the weaving machines. So we try and get an even balance. Like, and it's no, it's like going to a garage and buying a car. You yeah. kind of have to work out what you're going to get and yep. what you, if it's suitable for weaving your products. Yep, and then you know, when something goes down, you got to rig it together. Yep. There's a, you know, we've, we used to use a brother sewing machines mm -hmm. and um, it, they discontinued it in the early 2000s, I think. So we were buying used machines and yeah. getting the parts has been more mm -hmm. and more challenging. And then, you know, if the, if the control box goes yep. out, you know, and, and invariably things break and I have to fix it when I'm dressed nicely for the day. It's, yeah. It never happens if I'm in a t-shirt and a kilt that day. Uh -huh. It's only if I have, you know, a tweed on or something like that. Yeah. So with the Scottish Initiative, the how much that was one of the questions that I actually had um, when I first heard what you guys were doing with it. Is there enough sheep in mm -hmm. Scotland to give you know and to is there enough free free wool mm -hmm. I should say on Scottish sheep yeah. to give you guys enough for the demand that mm -hmm. you have because you know other industries yeah. and you know the the Isles and whatnot need their own wool as well. Yeah. So, I think Dawn or Margin Director she worked with. Uh, the yarn spinner at the time, and they worked out they could use like the two mixers, two breeds of sheep. There was enough spare wool to make what we would use like for another 16 ounce. So that's why we mix it with a Romley Marsh to give it. It's a slightly longer thread wool compared to the Cheviot. Right. And we've got the harder wear on the Cheviot sheep. Because you think all all the sheep's fleeces look the same? There's, there's no, not. they don't. Yeah. And um, when you go to the sorting office and got like, I've been to the sorting office for a quick visit, and I I thought. I was naive. I thought every fleece felt the same. No, there's some are great for that. Some is good for this. Some is good for that. So it's getting that market. So with the two breeds that we use are perfect. What we need for, and right. some other ones that are really coarse, we'll probably go into carpeting and maybe in, in um, outerwear or heavier tweeds. Heavier tweeds, or some people use it for insulation as well. In their house, like in their house, in their house instead of using like uh, what do you call? It? I call it rock wool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They will put fleece in. Yeah. Hmm, that's that's odd. It's, recy <laughs> it's recyclable. <clears throat> it is. I, I guess it wouldn't break down over time, especially nope. if it's between the walls. Um, hmm, interesting. Uh -huh. The um, so you were you were using sheep from New Zealand, Australia. Yeah, we still do, yeah. and some of our other weights as well. And obviously, we use mohair as well. We use cashmere. Yeah. But we'll buy it from reputable sources, so we know. What it is, and it's like if it says merino, it says cashmere. It is what it says in the tin, almost. Yeah, we know what we're doing, and we've dealt with the same yarn suppliers for years, so they know what we need and the quality that we've got. So yeah, that's where we are there. It's now. each of you have each of the mills have their own mixture, their own feel, their I think own most, intricacies. Yeah, I think most of us we's like we call it the grist of the world, be two thirty twos, two sixteens, etc. We all use the same, so we'll probably all buy it from the same spinners. But we were lucky enough to get our British wool from this spinner and take it from there. So Americans tend to be a little bit more matchy-matchy mm -hmm. than Scots. Um, to our detriment or credit, yeah. <laughs> whichever you want to say. Now, I know that um, you know, if you look at, you know, old uh, old photos of, you know, uh, clan sheaves or people walking around the Highland Games in Scotland, you'll have, you know, a brown tweed with a mm. modern kilt and love it blue hose or, you know, yeah. it doesn't match per se, but it blends well together. It tones well. Mm -hmm. It works, but it's not a matchy matchy no. thing. Where Americans tend to be more like, you know, I'm wearing a black shirt because there's black in this kilt. I have navy blue hose on because there's navy in the kilt. Mm -hmm. I have my red flashes for the red stripe in the kilt. Um, what do you think, as far as I don't want to say trends, but are are Scottish people still a little hodgepodge, less mixy or less matchy matchy, more mixy matchy, or is it more? Are they coming around to do it similar to how Americans tend to do it? Depends what event you're going to again. Okay. Black tie, you would be straight up and down. If you were wearing like a black jacket, you would be sorted. Right. To me, it's just what you feel like. I remember <clears throat> going to Dan like dinners for a while, then it was like everybody wore black shoes. Then somebody went to dinner and they wore brown shoes. He's <gasps> got brown shoes on. How dare noticing. they? But... When you look now, you probably find it's easy to pair, buy a pair of brown brogues than a pair of black brogues. Yeah. So it's like, so it's just kind of fashion, but it'll, it'll, everything comes round. So give it another 10 years when we're still sitting here like two old men. You'll, you'll have brown shoes, you'll have brown shoes on, I'll have black shoes on. There you go. Yeah, so. Now, do you think it's, do you think it is 
a younger thing? Do you think younger people like that are, let's say they're going to, you know, they're getting married yeah. or they're hiring their kit and that kind of thing. Um, are they going to tend to be more matchy matchy because that's what they were sort of given at the hire shop or versus with their bought and their parents are getting them into it. No, no, no. This is what you do. You do here. I'm going to get your hose. I'm going to get your jacket. Here's your kilt. This looks good. Both. It's just yeah. whatever, 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 one, whatever you feel comfortable in and one, it's maybe what you've only, that's all you've ever had. You'll wear what you've got. And if you're fortunate enough to have, be able to get X, Y, or Z for different places, you'll just wear what's there. If it's like a last minute dot com, you'll just go to the hash shop and get what you can get. Yeah. But if you want to look the part, spend the money, get a bespoke outfit, yeah, you want to be standing out. Yeah. You can go wild. When did hire shops, you know, this is, you know, probably going to be pre your time at Lock mm. Heron. So think back to your youth in 1926. <laughs> the um, when do you think higher shops really started gaining some ground, gaining some momentum? Was it in the mid 1990s with Braveheart and that mm. surge of nationalism and pride? And you know, hey, I should wear a kilt too. It's fun. You probably, I'd say, yeah, it's coming. Like, I'd say for the 90s, it's moved on. But I first started hiring kilts, right? Like going and get a higher kilt, you're only limited to like two, or three choices. You hardly ever see them in high ranges now. People yeah. have moved away from them. It's like people, so I would say by 90s, 90s onwards, things have moved on massively. Or you had to go around to so and so's house because he had a jacket, you went to his house for a jacket, borrowed somebody else's kilt. You, yeah. sort of, you made up, you made up an outfit, match your, like, your oh, kit. oh yeah. somebody's got a jacket outfit, you wear that. Instead of, you didn't know what to spend money in hires, so you just went around to people you knew or had bits of kilts or Highland product just to wear for a do. Right. Then you, most people had black shoes, you just wore your black shoes then. Yeah, and it matches everything. Because there's nothing worse than going to a wedding dance or a, a, a Kelly and wearing your Kelly brogue shoes and the lace comes off. Yep. You find one or two shandies and you try to tie it again. <laughs> like, yeah, that doesn't work. Yeah. Now, the do you think the... the I think I know what you're going to say, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Do you think the higher industry has led the trends? Do you think the trends have forced the higher industry in a specific direction? Or is it a bit of both? <laughs> Great answer. Both again. Yeah. Um, one of the fashion houses in UK, it's like for youngsters, they done like sort of tartan trousers, but you and me probably got an arm and one leg. <laughs> and but then that kind of feeds down, so you get the youngsters looking for really slim, tight fitting trousers, yeah. and you get a jacket as well. But then that fed people. Oh. Oh, it doesn't work for everybody. So can I get a pair of trues and that? So, and but tar every, tartans everywhere you look in like high end fashion or in the higher wear or just casual wear as well. And yeah. You walk it down the street, Morrill Mile in Edinburgh, there's tartan everywhere, it's tartan overload. Yeah. You, I drive 30 miles back to the factory, open the door, it's like, oh, I'm still tartan overload again. But it's there, it's everywhere you think. It's not just there, The I, I joke all the time about it. It's every time they they talk about, you know, what colors are in this season, yeah. what's in this season. This season, spoiler alert, tartan is oh, in. Oh. It's just like, yeah, every freaking year it's in. Of course it is, because it's freaking timeless. Yep. It's It looks just as good now mm -hmm. as it did 100 years ago and as it will in 100 yep. years. You've got so many tartans to, well, oh, there's so many thousand tartans in, in the register there now. Yep. Somebody could come along and pick that tartan for this season, <clears throat> that tartan for like the fall, spring, summer. It'll work. Yeah. yeah. So you've been to shops all over Scotland. Mm -hmm. You come here to the, the tiny little pit stop that is Spring City, PA. <laughs> um, in, in all seriousness, I am, I'm very curious about your, your opinion. What do you think of our shop in the store and the, the experience that we yeah. have here versus like the kind of things that you see in Scotland? When you walk in, when you drive up the car park, one, it's free parking. Edinburgh, you don't get free parking in Edinburgh. <laughs> well, we own the, we own the car park. <laughs> so so the, it's, you walk in the door, it's like you can see that if you walked in, you were like, I don't know where to start. You, go, you turn to your left, there's stuff there, what you need, you, can, you sort of build your outfit from all the way around the shop. And on your right hand side, it's like the, the cash desk, that's the main part. So you can go for, get, start with your kilt, get your spawn, right, the jackets are there, your ties are there, what flashes are you looking for your flashes? You can, you just walk around and it's all there, it's great. Instead of having to look through, like, we're coming back from the back shop and say, I've got a jacket, like this jacket, what about that jacket? You can see everything, what's, like, what you've got on display, it works, yeah. I like it. Thank yeah. you. And there's enough space in there too, you could have, some shops, you can maybe have like 10 people and you're like, there's no room, you could bring a, like a, a wedding party in, there's plenty, 
to say there's 12 in the wedding party. There's yep. enough room in that Two shop. Two men wait outside. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering now. Yeah, but no, it works. I like how you, you just want to walk around the, fa- the factory, the store, and you can see everything it is, and you've got the cash desk and the right bit. Now, when you go into Scotland and do it into a store in Scotland, um, the the experience of buying a kilt mm-hmm. is it when when the average you know twenty yeah. something year old Scot goes into a, a an actual store, are they going in with minimal knowledge, no knowledge, all the knowledge? Do they go in and generally say like, hey, I, all right, I know I want a Prince Charlie jacket, yeah. I know I want this mm-hmm. tartan, I know I want modern, I know I want La Caron storm cloth. Or Some of them will have mannequins made up with mm-hmm. outfits <clears throat> on, and depends what, what it is. There might be some like a one relevant to that area, some like a national one. Some just like, they may have like three or four different outfits. It's like I like that one. They'll come in, they'll see that, and that's mm-hmm. it. Right, and they'll, they'll go through, get measured up. That's it. Or if you want to go like bespoke, they'll have a room off to the side, and they'll take you there, and you'll sit down. They'll they'll actually talk you through getting your own kilt made if you want one but it's not like separately you can go uh, what you can go down the family route if you like one whatever colors you like take from there if you want a tweed jacket you want a black jacket and just sort of bespoke it up there like if you want different right. linings you can do that so you can most shops you can go turn left or right and you can go like do the higher route or if you do the bespoke route and it all works so i'm going to put you on the spot a little bit the again you obviously have a vested interest. You work for Lock Heron, so you have vested interest in selling cloth mm-hmm. worldwide, not just in Scotland. Yep. But as a Scottish man, as a Scottish person, yep. um, do you think, how, how do you think Scots feel about the diaspora, whether it's Americans, Germans, you know, Australians, Canadians? Mm-hmm. What do you think people in general feel about other cultures and you know other, other people around the world mm-hmm. who are not, Scottish born and bred yeah. but have that 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 heritage that pull that family connection what do you think most Scots feel about those people wearing a kilt do they understand the reasons why or they just think we're playing at it I think I understand the reasons why prime example world pipe band championships in Glasgow there's pipe bands from anywhere in the world everywhere in the world almost yeah they're all wearing tartan and they might have one connect some one person in the band may have a connection with Scotland the rest don't. They're all wearing that, and they all look good. And hopefully, it comes from like one the mills what we are talking about as well. Now that's more of a a uniform type. Mm-hmm. The thing. Uniform, yeah. If you're talking on individual people, individual persons, yeah, yeah. I think they may have they may have been to a wedding here and seen the product, or seen p- pictures of it, or family members. I think I'll have a kilt. It, one, it's a good investment because it's like you can pass it down the line. I think it doesn't bother me who, who wears a kilt. Uh, right. uh, it's Shrek's wore a kilt <clears throat> anybody can wear a kilt yeah <laughs> they can fit anyone out of a kilt <clears throat> one of the things that I found uh, interesting was someone talking about this type of thing and they said that Scots wear the kilt as part of their national mm-hmm. identity so to speak their yeah. family identity uh, as well as national identity it's kind of who they are as a country whereas Americans, Canadians, you know, the diaspora will wear a kilt to feel a connection to something mm-hmm. like through their own personal family heritage, not through, you know, a, a, a larger connection to Scotland mm-hmm. necessarily. <clears throat> it's kinda of hard to my answer. Like I know I was like think of family own. My son's in New Zealand, he was he's got a kilt. There is kilt shops in New Zealand because there's so many there's mm-hmm. expats mm-hmm. all over the world. Yep. And there's always a connection. If you went to like somebody's wedding no connection, you've no, no connection to Scotland, but you're going to somebody from, we know, from Scotland who's wearing a kilt. I'll wear a kilt too. You know, I quite like this. Yeah. yeah. And it's always a talking point when you go <coughs> somewhere as well. People, where are you from? And you just get chatting it, and it kind of breaks the ice with other people as well. It's quite, I think it's quite cool sometimes just to wear a kilt and you get chatting. I agree. I was at the trade show at the weekend. Yeah. I went to the Starbucks along the road. I just walked up <laughs> Plaza Drive. Right. It's like the kilt and just walked up, and it's like you can see people looking at me, and they think they must think he's Scottish. And but I already at the trade show, I just wear it, it's comfy, yeah. as you do as well. You think it's quite comfy, it's quite yeah. cool as well. It's what I find is it's 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 beautiful that there's this one little country floating in the middle of the Atlantic mm-hmm. where it's or nation that it's so many people around the world 
have this affinity to, yeah. and it's it's the the number of Scots that and the things that the Scots have given the world, you know, through inventions, through all of it, and as to how the culture has just you know kind of mm -hmm. gone and spread. It's it's neat to see that respect not only in the industry of yeah. people there, but it's in you know and in the culture and in the the world culture of how much the world appreciates Scotland and what it has done and what mm -hmm. it has given to the world as a whole. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I, I believe Neil Armstrong, has got, he's got a family connection to Langham, which is about 30 miles south of Selkirk. So he came in the 70s, so he's got the freedom. So I think there's there's been a bit of tartan on the moon as well. It Double. wasn't him, it was uh, it was the McBean tartan. It was. it was. It was. It wasn't Neil Armstrong, but it was another another astronaut. Astronaut, yes. So there's been tartan on the moon, yeah, so yeah. There's, there's tartan everywhere. <clears throat> and so it does, like, even though it's a small piece, it means yeah. something to somebody that has been somewhere else. Like it's good. Yeah. And you walk into some like ancestral, you know, fashion castles, and they've got a scrap of tartan. You think, look at that. But then something like, can you get that reproduced? Yeah, yeah. we can do that. You can do things like that. It's like, but it's good that it's been all over the world. So from family to the moon, TV, it's everywhere. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. That's why I say tartan is Scotland's gift to the world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, Keith, I want to thank you cool. for coming out today. I no appreciate it very much. Yep. Boys and girls, thank you for watching. Yep, and thank you. Until next time, Slanjava. Cheers. Thanks for watching my interview with Keith Russell from Lock Heron, guys. Let me know in the comments did I ask all the questions you would want to hear answered? Who else do you want to see me interview from all the mills and all the contacts we have in Scotland? Let us know so we can do more of this type of content for you. If you like this type of thing, please remember, give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel.